Let's get down to the real business of taking care of the people. We can't have a testimony without a test. And we are being tested whether we have courage enough, conviction enough, people power enough to stand up and do what is right for ourselves and generations yet unborn. Senator Sanders, it is such a pleasure to have you on the debut of the Nina Turner Show. It is an honor to be here with one of my favorite people in the country. Well, thank you, Senator. I was hoping you said the world, but you said the All country. right. Well, it's a small oh, world. It's a small <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it is it's wonderful. So we are in Chicago at the People's Summit, and you gave a riveting speech last night. Thank you. How did it feel to take a selfie with over 4,000 of your closest oh, friends? Of my intimate, close, intimate. personal friends. Yes. Well, it's great. The energy here is extraordinary. Um, Roseanne DeMauro's doing a great job. My wife Jane's doing a great job. You're doing a great job. We had a lot of the nurses here. Yeah. It is a great collection of people from all over the country, from every kind of background. And it's exactly what we need to revitalize the progressive movement, go home, start winning elections, start fighting for the progressive vision that you and I share. Absolutely. You talked about the sister power. I don't know if you know that Roseanne, Dr. J, who I finally call your wife, Dr. J, and myself, we are the three amigas. I know that. We got sister power You're going. a threat to the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. In a good In way, absolutely. In a very absolutely. good way. So, Senator, last night you shared uh, your vision, your constant vision, in talking about racial justice, social justice, climate justice. But you also pinpointed the fact that during movements like this, and even when people were chanting your name, you said, it's not about me, it's, it's right. you, which is powerful. What, what history you... is about, and people have to understand that in these very difficult times. Change never comes from on top, it always comes from below. That's what the workers' movement in this country is about, where working people stood up against incredible odds to fight for unions. It's what the civil rights movement is about, where millions of people fought uh, fight against racism, it's the women's movement, it's the gay movement. It's when whole lots of people at the grassroots level come together so that the people on top look around them and they say, we have no choice. We have got to do the right thing. You know, the leaders follow the people, not yeah. the other way around. Uh, and that's what this is about. And, and what I will say, Nina, is I, I see uh, a tremendous upsurge of grassroots activism all over this country taking place in many forms. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about that. We got to keep that going. We really do. Now, Senator, there's this kind of tension going on within the Democratic Party. Uh, you really critiqued the Democratic Party quite strongly last night. There are some that don't necessarily believe that the Democratic Party can be saved, but you do. Well, this is what I think, you know, I think any objective assessment of where the Democratic Party is today, and above and beyond the presidential election. If you look at the fact that Republicans control the Senate, the House, the White House, they control almost two-thirds of the state house, uh, governor's offices uh, around this country. Uh, Democrats have lost almost 1,000 seats in legislative, you, you yeah. former state senator, oh, you know yeah. about this stuff, yes. right? Uh, the model has failed. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe at this moment uh, what has got to be done, and I know there are people who disagree with me, uh, I think what we are seeing is around the country, people moving into the Democratic Party, working people, young people, progressives, prepared to transform the Democratic Party. That's where I am right now. And you really believe that it can be? We will see what happens. I can't, t you know, I'm not gonna speculate. What we know is there are people, and I often say this, unbelievably, who would rather go down with the Titanic. Yes. So long as they're on top, they got the bird's eye view of the yeah. Titanic going down rather than change it. But the current model, and structure of the Democratic Party is failing. And we need to bring millions of people into it who understand that we cannot continue an economy that works for the 1%, mm -hmm. a corrupt political system where the Koch brothers and billionaires are buying elections. It's got to change. And uh, I think the people of this country are catching on and are demanding that change. And even in the world, you did make reference to Jeremy right. Corbyn right. and the great work that he was able to... And you know what that was about? Media here didn't pick up on it. But that campaign turned around because the Labor Party brought forth what they call a manifesto, we would call a platform. Yes. And it was a progressive manifesto. Mm -hmm. It said to the working people, to the young people, that we have got to create a nation that works for you, not just the elite. And that's what people want in this country. They're sick and tired 
yeah. of working longer hours for lower wages. They're sick and tired of the inner cities in this country. What unemployment? 20, 30 percent for the kids? Yes. Now, if unemployment is 30 percent and a kid does not get a job, it doesn't have the education. You tell me what's going to happen. What else there will they do? And we're right here in Chicago, Senator, where you know there's lots of tension, especially on the south side, yeah. uh, the west side. Yeah. But the African American community in particular really feels under siege. That's right. Poverty, they're suffocating because right. of poverty. And just because somebody's poor doesn't predispose them to be criminal. That's not the issue. But when you have these symptoms that bubble up, poor people are more vulnerable in, in that way. What, I mean, we're, we're right here where those things are happening. Chicago is just an example right. of the other struggles that are going on right. across this country. Right. What are your thoughts about how people should leverage from the local level? Now, this is not just about the federal level. The power of the people to make their lives better. It is better. what the demand has got to be. It is criminal that we have communities where youth unemployment is 20 or 30 percent. What we have to, got to do is to get teachers and mentors to provide jobs and educational opportunity. If we keep an eye on kids, you know what? They don't have to drop out of school. Yeah. If we provide job training, there are jobs out there, but I worry that many of these kids are not going to have the skills because they're not getting the education. This is not rocket science. We can do that. Mm -hmm. It requires a commitment to say to that kid, you know what? You're not going to drop out of school because we love you. We're concerned about you. You're going to sit down. You're going to learn the skill. And by the way, there's a job over there. And when that kid goes out and starts earning a paycheck, his or her life is going to be profoundly changed. You know, uh, Senator, you sound a lot like President FDR when he gave his four freedom speech. He talked about what the political and economic system, what people deserve from that system. And I think the first thing he named was youth and others, jobs for youth and others. That speech never got the kind of attention that it deserved. But what it said is, you know, we have the Bill of Rights that protects your political freedoms, your religious freedoms. We all agree with that. But what about economic freedoms? Yes. Are you entitled as a human being in America to health care? Yes. If you are a young person or any person in a changing economy, are you entitled to get education? Or if you don't have the money, are you just left aside and, and not able to go to, to college or to a post high school training program? Uh, and what Roosevelt said is that we have got to, when we talk about rights, it's not just political rights, religious rights, it is economic rights. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe when you talk about freedom, if you are unemployed and you're uneducated, you know what? I'm not so sure what kind of freedom you're going to experience in your life. But some would say that people are poor because they choose to be poor, because they've made bad decisions. That if you, if someone that can't afford health care, for example, or can't afford to send their children to college or wherever else their children would decide to go to increase their skill set, that really that is on the individual. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't believe that for a second. I mean, and I think. The people who make those statements have never lived for one second in the shoes of those people who are making decisions. Um, you know, there is such a thing as individual responsibility, no question about it. And we all have to take responsibility for our lives. But when you live in a community where unemployment is just terrifically high, uh, where there are no jobs, where there are, your schools are dropout factories, that has got to be taken into consideration before you go around criticizing people. And I got to tell you something, I get sick and tired of these people on top who have billions and billions of dollars uh, blaming people who are struggling every day to put food on the table for the problems that they face. Now, Senator, we're the, the, the people who have come to the People's Summit are the people who really do believe in the messages that you put out from your, your campaign. Last year was the first People's Summit. It was almost, it was 3,000 people there this year. It's over 4,000 people, and people are coming because they believed in your message of revolution. What is your recommendations to those people who believe so strongly, but at times when things, when, when people lose or they don't get that change right then and there, sometimes they lose hope. What would you say to them? What I would say is what the revolution means is that we each of us, it's not one person on top, and you've heard me say this a million times, because Nina and I have gone around the country together, <laughs> is it's all of us standing up. And when we all stand up together, there is nothing that can stop us. That's just simple truth. Uh, you know, people are, if they watch television all the time, they're led to believe that somebody else is going to make the decision. We can do it together. 
And we've seen many, many examples of that throughout history. But I think right now the message must be that the fights that we're waging, it's not just about you and it's not just about me. It's your kids, it's your grandchildren, it's my grandchildren. It is the future generations of this country. And, and the, to, to, to cut it to the chase, the issue is do we become an oligarchy in which a handful of billionaires control the political and economic life of our country, where the very, very rich get richer and almost everybody else get poorer? Do we live on a planet in which climate change causes horrific problems in this country and around the world in terms of drought and flood, which will lead to international conflict? Or do we as a people come together and say, you know what, this ain't the way it should be. We have the technology now, Nina, to really greatly improve the standard of living of people all around the world. That's a good thing, mm -hmm. okay? But we need to gain the control and power to make the good decisions. So, Senator, in your environment, in your world right now on the federal level, government, things are a little toxic. Little toxic? Just a little bit, a little toxic. <laughs> I'm being an optimist here, just a little toxic. <laughs> and there's lots of talk of impeachment of Mr. Trump. Some people feel as though, you know, that line has been crossed and, and impeachment should happen. What do you say? I mean, how, how, what are your thoughts and feelings? Well, this is my that? thoughts. I think that, you know, as I know you know, uh, there's almost nothing that Trump has done that I approve of. I think he's been a disastrous president. But when you talk about impeachment, it is absolutely imperative that the American people feel comfortable that the facts have led us in that direction. So right now, many of us uh, insisted on a special prosecutor. Bob Mueller is now the special prosecutor. I don't know Mueller personally, but I've heard that he is a serious a forceful guy who's prepared to do the right thing. He's a former FBI. Former director, director. of the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, we got um, in the House and in the Senate, you have more or less bipartisan uh, investigations taking place over the question, two questions. Number one, did the Trump campaign collude with the Russians uh, in undermining our 2016 elections? And the second issue is, uh, are there credible charges of obstruction of justice on the part of the president? Did the president fire Comey mm -hmm. because he was doing the investigation? And we've got to proceed in a uh, bipartisan way to get the facts, and we'll see where they lead. And if they lead that, I mean, some people really believe that that is the total answer, that, in other words, Mr. Trump caused all of the distress that we have in, in the country right now. I mean. There are a group of people who really believe that that he must go, no matter. Well, I don't. Th that's not the way it works. Okay. I mean, he is a horrendous president. I mean, tax breaks for billionaires, cuts the programs for working people, refusal to acknowledge climate change, lying all the time. You know, he is just an awful president. But there is a process. You got a constitution. Awful presidents can stay in office if they do not commit impeachable. Actions. High crimes. High crimes and misdemeanors. misdemeanors. And, and that's what we're looking at. And that's the way it's got to be. But I think what I worry about right now, you talk about Washington, is the Republican health care plan in the House was probably the ugliest, most destructive piece of legislation I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine throwing 23 million people off of health insurance, defunding Planned Parenthood, raising premiums for older workers, cutting Medicaid, $800, 800 billion. billion dollars. You know what that yes. will mean? The Cleveland, the Burlington, Vermont, Hara. And then his budget. Yeah. His budget, massive cuts. You think, viewers, think about the programs that are important to your lives, to the lives of the middle class and working families. They will be cut, in some cases, eliminated. And at the same time, this guy wants to give $3 trillion in tax breaks to the top 1%. It is vulgar. So that's kind of where we are right now in terms of organizing and fighting back. And so to that very point, though, your message really is to the people that we have to be prepared, that this is preparation time, that resistance and resilience go hand in hand. You cannot, you know, as I said a moment ago, despair really is not an option. Because it's not just your life. It's the lives of your community, your kids, and future generations. So our moral obligation is to continue the fight. And what I want to say, and I've said this, I said it last night, and I'll repeat it again, on virtually every major issue, the American people are on our side, okay? You go home, and I speak to the viewers now, talk to people in your community, people who voted for Trump, ask them, 
whether they think it's a great idea to give tax breaks to billionaires and cut Medicare or cut Medicaid or after school programs or nutrition programs. Very few people think that makes sense. So the good news, Nina, is the vast majority of the people in this country support, in my view, a progressive agenda. Our job is to bring them together, to take on all of the money from the Koch brothers and the other billionaires in the elections and to start winning some elections. And I've seen you, Senator, in other town halls really sitting side, sitting right next to people who did vote for right. Mr. Trump. Right. And you have been able to move those people to your side. How is that? Because we see a lot of signs around that says love Trump's hate. But when it comes down to it, there's lots of vulgarity going on between citizens. Over, hate People are hateful right. towards one another yes. because of that. All right. Nina, I will not deny for one second that there is a part of Trump's support which is racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. That's true, period. We're not going to get to those people. But I think your average Trump supporter is somebody today sitting maybe in Ohio, uh, sitting somebody, somewhere in, in Michigan or wherever, and people who have worked hard their whole lives, they've seen their jobs go to China and Mexico, can't afford to send their kids to college, worried to death about the future of this country. And they are asking, who worries about me? Who worries that I'm working two or three jobs, that I'm making half the wages that I use, that I can't afford to retire? Anyone worrying about me? And I think we can reach out to those people and say, yeah, we are on your side. We got to stand together. Don't fall for Trump's nonsense of blaming Muslims or Latinos for all of your problems. Take a look at Wall Street and what they did to this country. Right. You can't afford prescription drugs. It's not some guy picking strawberries for eight bucks an hour That's right. who caused that problem, okay? Let's work together, not let Trump divide us up. And we got a whole pe Goldman Sachs and Enron and all of these multi-billion right. dollar corporations. You know how much for... harm Wall Street did to millions of people in oh, this yeah. country? Oh, know, yeah. African-American wealth plummeted. Yes. Most of that value. wealth is in homes. That's exactly. Right. Housing values went down. That's it. Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, we got to look at those guys. And by the way, of course, Trump and his friends want to once again deregulate Wall Street. Absolutely. Well, Senator, if we are fast forwarding to 2018 and you're back at the People Summit, what would your message be to the attendees in 2018? Well, in 2018, I'm going to be working really hard. I'm going to drag you into this fight as well. Uh, Anytime. All right, we have got to win a lot of seats. I think there is a lot of discontent uh, in this country against Trump's economic policies, against his effort to divide us up, against his movement toward authoritarianism. We have got to get out there and bring people together and start winning seats. And if we can do that, if we can win the Senate, if we can win the House, we can put a real break on these disastrous policies coming from the administration. And win seats with people who are really committed Absolutely. to the people? Absolutely. A progressive agenda. A progressive agenda. Well, Senator, I'm telling you, people all over this country owe you a great debt of gratitude because you, in the words of Teddy Roosevelt, were the man in the arena, the doer of the deeds, and very much in the spirit of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm when she said her very presence is redefining a new era in America. Your presence, not just in 2016, but from the very start, and you are a very modest man. I want our viewers to know that you don't talk about yourself a whole lot. But I know at the age of 21, you weren't thinking, let me stand up against segregation and racism and discrimination at the University of Chicago so I can one day run for president. <laughs> you did that because you have absolute heart-soul agreement. And this world is a better place because of you, Senator Sanders. Adore you. Thank madly. you so much. Okay. Real News Network exclusive with the one and only Senator Bernie Sanders, the man of the in the arena, the doer of the deeds, and the person that has reminded us that it is not about him. It is really all about us. It is about you, your children, and your children's children. And we all need you. This is Nina Turner on the Nina Turner Show on the Real News Network. Thank you for joining us.
Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm at the People's Summit in Chicago. And now joining us is the host of our new show, The Nina Turner Show, Senator Nina Turner. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Paul Dave. So you launched your show. Uh, your first interview with, with, was with Senator Bernie Sanders. Um, in, in his speech uh, the night before, uh, Senator Sanders was uh, as critical or even more critical of the Democratic Party, certainly since the, uh, the primaries, mm -hmm. calling Democratic Party a failed party, I believe. And, yes. Um, the reason why Mr. Trump won, he said Democrats failed. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of people we're talking to here, and it's not just here, it's been happening for the last months, are, are debating, you know, should Bernie start seriously considering a run outside of the Democratic Party, or should everyone be considering building a structure outside of the Democratic Party? I've, uh, what, what do you make of that argument in that debate? I mean, I think you can do both and. I, I agree with the senator in some ways. I mean, I dedicated my life to the values of this party. And, you know, it's kind of hard to walk away from your lover, if you will. You know, it's not, not an easy thing to do. And because we have the Unity Reform Commission, you know, something that the senator fought to have, where you have people who are appointed to that commission by the senator, you have people appointed to that commission by Secretary Clinton. It was the agreement that they both had. And you have people, about, I think, three people appointed by the chairman, Chairman Perez. And so we had our second meeting in June, and we are going to be talking about and pushing for policy changes on the very issues that people were concerned about, i.e. superdelegates. So in a way, you know, the senator is doing the right thing, I think, to, to see this unity reform commission through. Um, the, uh, this contradiction between the oligarchy and, and the uh, people of the Democratic Party. Yes. The, the, this is not a compromisable thing. It's, you could have temporary compromises. You can have truces. Uh, but the underlying uh, differences between Wall Street Democrats, Chuck Schumer Democrats, and working class Democrats, it's really a, it's an antagonistic fight. Yes. And uh, so, so and, and Bernie talks about fighting the oligarchy, he not does. just about reforming the Democratic Party. Right. So, so if, if, it's, if its underlying is antagonistic, the unity is, is to, in order to create some kind of rule framework, like, mm -hmm. for example, the reduction of the number of superdelegates. Mm -hmm. But is it enough to make it a fight that's winnable? I mean, we will see. I mean, it's my hope, Paul, Jay, that beyond the Unity Reform Commission, that the leaders within the Democratic Party itself will see the wisdom that change must come that the atmosphere that elected Mr. Trump is one that the Democrats should be concerned about beyond the Unity Reform Commission. That, and in some ways, we need to do an autopsy. You remember when the Republicans did an autopsy in 2012? The Democrats have yet to do that, and they have yet to think critically, have a critical analysis about not just what happened in 2016, but also what has been happening since 2009. One of the critiques I've heard of the People's Summit, and it's been mostly positive, there hasn't been a lot of critique. There's a lot of enthusiasm. Yes. Uh, but one critique I've heard is, is on the question of why isn't foreign policy being talked about here? Uh, I don't, there wasn't a workshop, there wasn't a yeah. central speaker. And it's a very dangerous time in terms of foreign policy. Trump is planning something, is not planning, we know what he's doing. Right. He's creating an alliance with the Saudi Arabia to isolate Iran. Yeah. It looks pretty likely, even Trump has said so, about mm -hmm. uh, building up troop levels in, mm -hmm. in, into Iraq. He's even, yeah. He jokes about going back and seizing Iraqi oil. Yes. But, but there's no foreign policy discussion here. Well, you know, Paul Jay, this is the second year of the People's Summit. I mean, it was really born from Senator Sanders' run. And so, you know, hope maybe next year that will be added on. But there's so much. This country, you know, since the presidency of of George W. Bush, President Bush, we have been constantly focusing every single effort on what is happening outside of our shores. And domestically, people have been falling behind. So I don't think it's not, it's not necessarily that the people here at the People's Summit don't care about those issues, but not, not many people are talking about what is happening, what the needs of the people are right here in this country. But you bring up a really good point. So can that be added to next year? Next year will be the third year. Absolutely. Is that something that some of the people have come in from 49 states, as you know? I'm sure some of them are talking about these issues, 
but we do have many opportunities to make that within the framework is what you're talking about within the conversation piece the workshops within the people summit what how do you see balancing this fight inside the party against the oligarchy as it exists inside the democratic party uh, and this issue of fighting some of the draconian policies that are coming out of the Trump administration. I don't think we, we, we shouldn't be, not be fighting for balance. We really are fighting for revolution within the Democratic Party itself in many ways. And you remember a think tank, a Democratic think tank, and I can't remember the name of it right now, just recently did a focus group on Obama 12 voters who, who voted for, who voted, people who voted for President Obama in 12 and then voted for Mr. Trump in 2016. And these very people, when asked to identify which party is the party of Wall Street, actually named the Democratic Party. Well, they're not so far off. Like they're not. And at the polling right now, there's only a 1% difference in approval rating between the Democrats and the Republicans, even with someone as polarizing as Donald Trump in the White House, someone that has proven himself to this point unworthy of the office, Democrats are still considered the party of the elite. And so to me right now, this is not about balance. This is really about shaking up the very foundation of the Democratic Party. That is part of what this People Summit is about. And I do, I do caution that if the Democrats don't heed the message of the messages of the people, that the majority of the people in this country right now, Paul J, identify as independents, that if they don't heed the lessons and the feelings that the people are expressing, that they're going to continue to erode people who are so-called card-carrying members of the Democratic Party. So we, this is not about that. We want imbalance right now, imbalance to the, to the point that we are going to shake things up and bring that party back to, FDR, to the FDR frame. The, the idea of progressive candidacies and, and challenging right-wing Democrats, what's the lay of the land for, like that for in Ohio? Well... <laughs> Not, I mean, my, my state swings. You know, we are the quintessential swing state. We swung for President Obama both in 08 and 2012. But on the legislature and the statewide level, every single statewide office is held by a Republican. And there is a supermajority in both chambers in the state legislature. I mean, I, when I was there, we had 12 members and we were uh, thanking God for that. Now there are only nine Democrats in the Ohio Senate right now. We lost, we lost seats in 2016. I explain that. The fact that the, the Trump wave took over in... No, in, but not... But, oh. but it was even before then they yeah. had this super, super majority. Super majority, meaning they did not even have, they didn't even need Democrats to come on the floor of the Senate, for example, to conduct the state's business. That's how far in the minority and A lot of we that were. happened over the Obama years. Over the, yes, and that's the point, Paul J., that we really have to have these deep conversations with the people in this country that it is not enough just to come out and vote for a president. We have to vote every single year. There's an election. There's issues on the ballot. There are people running. We lost most of the seats that Democrats lost were on the state level of government, were on the governor's mansions. And I would argue that is where we're losing most of the progress up until this point, where we have extreme right, right wingers in, 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 in the Congress, and then we have President Trump. But to that point, most of the ground that was lost have been lost in states in st on the state level. Government. You said in your speech this morning uh, when you opened the conference uh, essentially that the reason for losing all these seats and losing these governor mansions is because people's life didn't get better. It didn't, Paul Jay, and we, we can't delude ourselves on that. The quality of life is not what it once was. Uh, you and I talk to people, you're in Baltimore, I'm in Cleveland, people who only needed maybe a job or a job and a half two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, now they're working two and three jobs. Parents who don't have time to spend with their children because they're at work. Mothers and fathers who are afraid to let their children walk down the street because of violence. Infrastructure that is broken and torn up that it doesn't benefit individuals or businesses. I mean, we have a real crisis on our hands. And it's more a crisis of consciousness from both parties, but I, my critique is the harshest on Democrats because we know better. And because we know better, we should do better. And we have failed the American people. Uh, you were quoted as saying uh, that when you go home and talk to people in Cleveland, 
Uh, they're not talking about Russians. No. You know, they're talking about their problems. They are. And, uh, so why, why is the Democratic Party leadership so preoccupied with, with, what, with what in the scheme of things is relatively minor? Even if there was Russian interference in the elections, it didn't determine the outcome of the election. No. I mean, I've been joking, the reason the American elites are so concerned about the Russians, because only American elites are allowed to rig American elections. No one else, no one else <laughs> is that, allowed to do that. Isn't that the truth? And that's as American as apple that, pie. It, it, I mean, is, is Goldman Sachs a threat? You know, is Wall Street a threat? Are the people who refuse to honor the, the wishes of the Native American people in North Dakota, are they a threat? I mean, we have many threats. And, and, and make no mistake about it, the, the intelligence agencies have said that, that Russia interfered and there should be a consequence for that. We have to do something about that. To, but to have the American if we, people... If we believe if, it. So if, far, if the we, intelligence right, is pretty if, thin. If we, if we believe it, right? But at the same time... Well, you asked me a question. Why do I think that the uh, uh, Democratic elite so preoccupied are preoccupied? Because this. they think that that's what's going to help them win in 2018 instead of thinking, oh, let me dance on the tables until we fix the infrastructure in Flint or places like West Virginia. You know, I got a chance to talk to a young lady from West Virginia who said that the same challenges in Flint about clean, regarding clean water, is happening to our sisters and brothers in in West Virginia, but who's talking about that? In Baltimore, it's lead paint, and there's... Same thing in Cleveland. Evidence that may be worse in Baltimore than the water problem was in Flint. Same thing in Cleveland. I think it was Rutgers University that did a study that, that proves out just your point, that there are 3,000 other areas, urban and rural areas in this country, who have higher lead levels, whether it's paint, whether it's water, whether it's le le you know, lead leaching, the same problem, but greater, greater, higher levels than even in Flint. Can we do some of that all at the same time? Yes, we need leaders who are going to protect this country from threats, both foreign and domestic. But in the meantime, can we do something to help the people in this country who are suffering and still handle that at the same time? I mean, there's a convergence of this issue of dealing with foreign policy. Uh, climate change and yes. dealing with domestic problems because you know taking 54 billion dollars and giving more of it to 54 million billion more to the Pentagon by trashing all domestic social programs yes. I mean that's why I would go back to this issue of foreign policy here yeah. whether whether it's at the conference or yeah, not I forget it. it the conference is yeah. done now yeah. but we need to be having that conversation because uh, America's getting ready for war mm -hmm. and one of the ways it's getting ready is not by taxing the people who have the money to pay for it yeah. not in any way am I suggesting there should be such a war yes. but by trashing uh, as many of the social programs as possible you say follow the money yeah. Right. Where I always tell my constituents, I've told my constituents and people that I serve and I continue to serve that follow the money. If you want to know where the policy principles and priorities is a better word of people you elect to office, follow the budget, follow the money. So no, absolutely your point is well taken, Paul J. But it's all in the way that you're framing that and you are framing the notion of war in a way that puts the breadcrumbs out there that it, this is a domestic concern as well. There's an umbrella to that. And we talk, you and I talk a lot about the environmental as well, that that is not a secondary, that that issue is really at the foundation. Yeah, because this, this administration is a fossil fuel administration. Oh, no doubt about all it. All the foreign policy, in, in fact, domestic, is all driven by serving oil companies. Yes. And the, the, the preparation for a, a troop surge in Iraq and, and, and Trump joked when he spoke to the CIA uh, just after his inauguration, he said, uh, we should have seized Iraqi oil the first time. And sure. then he jokes and says, he hey, you guys are going to have a second crack at yeah. it. That's what they're planning to do with a destabilization, destabilization plan in Iran. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very dangerous situation. Yes, it is. And, and he really told people who he was when he was running. But what he tapped into... Uh, on the negative side is the fears of many Americans in this country and that fear was built upon the fact that people who had the power who wanted to do good who had the who could have done good failed to use the power of the people to do that good and so I do agree with Senator Sanders critique that you know Mr. Trump is in office because of the failure of Democrats and and the, it's these Democrats that are cheering on the most warlike activity mm -hmm. of Trump. They're with them on the war side. Completely. Right? Like Chuck They're Schumer's hawks. out there, go, go Trump, go, right. when it comes to yeah. allying with the Saudis and targeting Iran. Yeah.
no doubt about it. And and I think that brings up another important point that some as some sometimes the people who vote can't really tell the difference between a Republican and a Democrat, and hence is our conundrum. Mm. And uh, one of the things I thought very interesting about the People's Summit was the number of people running for office across the country. Uh, we had a Real News booth down there, and candidate after candidate after candidate, some who have actually who have won, yes. some who have a good chance of winning. Uh, yeah. What did you make of that? Not just running for you know state rep or school board member, mem people running for Congress, but I talking to people that are actually running to be the chairman and chairwomen of their respective Democratic parties in their home state which that is what we need. We need progressives to challenge the status quo, to challenge the establishment. That goes back to the point that you were making about whether or not the Democratic Party can really be reformed. I say that if progressives run for these seats from precinct level to state level to running to challenge establishment Democratic Democrats for the chair chairship, that then we can start to turn this thing around. So it's not just you know running on uh, running for state rep or state senator. It is also running within the Democratic Party uh, apparatus itself. And I got to give a shout out, Paul, to Kimberly Ellis, who ran California, California lost by 62 votes. But I would say in many ways she did not lose because she shook the very foundation of that place by challenging an establishment Democrat and coming so very close. I, I don't know if you know the answer to this yet, but is Sanders grunting in 2020? <laughs> he sure is going like he's running. Oh my God, you know what, I, I don't know, but what I do know, and you probably saw the same thing, this is Bernie Nation here, that he was here with 4,000 of his closest friends. There is no doubt that he has energized people across the spectrum. 54% of the of the attendees here were people of color. I want to put that out there. Uh, the plurality here were in their 30s. And again, that really is a big deal, and that is a symbol about the future that they want to see. So if 4,000 people here had a, any say, Senator Bernie Sanders would be, will be, would be running in 2020. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, the, Nina's interview with uh, Senator Sanders is going to be up on the uh, Real News Network in a very short amount of time. If you want to see it again, of course, you can find it somewhere here on Facebook as well and watch it again. And look forward to uh, the Nina Turner Show. Uh, we will give you a schedule very soon of a rollout of different episodes. So I think for the next little while, it's going to be every few days of People Summit interviews. And then it will be a regular weekly show on the Real News Network. So thank you, Senator Turner. Thank you, Paul J. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.